Life is worth the living just because he lives. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. And we uh, was led in the scripture reading by Elder Abraham as he reviewed with us the experience of Captain Naaman. I want to share with you a message this morning entitled, when it, when it makes no sense, do it anyhow. When it makes no sense, do it anyhow. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you today that Christ lives. And we thank you, dear Lord, that his life is assurance to us that a better day is coming after a while. As we consider your word this day, we ask that you would touch our hearts now and condition our hearts to be receptive to that which you have recorded in your holy scriptures uh, for our learning and admonition. I pray that you be with your manservant, who is but an instrument in your hands. Help me to rightly represent you as I come before your people on this holy Sabbath day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart prove to be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When it doesn't make sense, do it anyhow. I just want to clarify that by saying that when it doesn't make sense of what God has directed us to do, we should do it anyhow. We may not understand the instructions, we may not understand the whys, but the fact that God said it, the fact that God has commanded it, even though it doesn't make sense, we are encouraged to do it anyhow. But the saints of God, saints of God say, amen. When we open our Bibles, we find in our Bibles many instructions, many texts of encouragement, commandments. And there are many proverbs. And those proverbs, and in the proverbs, uh, we are warned about the sin of pride. We warn that the sin of pride is a dangerous offense. In fact, in Proverbs, the 16th chapter and the 18th verse, it declares that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, verse 18 links to verse 19, where it says, better to live humbly with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. The meaning of the passage this morning is quite clear cut. Pride leads to humiliation. In other words, it is better to be humble and poor than proud and rich. A similar proverb explains the message. In Proverbs, the 18th chapter and the 12th verse, we're told haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility uh, precedes honor. While pride sets us on an ill-fated uh, course, the opposite of pride, which is humility, leads to honor. To choose pride is to set 
oneself up for a fall. The pedestal we make for ourselves often proves to be a precarious foundation. It was during the days of Muhammad Ali, famous fighting boxer, that Hamali, um, that Ali used to go around, and, I, and I'm sure we can all remember uh, that he would go around and in a type of arrogance, uh, he would say that he was the greatest. When he would take a man out in the ring, knock him down, knock him out, he would stand over him, hold up his hands, and, and he would declare, I am the greatest, uh, which made everyone want, which made everyone uh, wanted to see somebody take him out. But he was not in, he was not easy to take out. He was good at what he was doing. But humility was never one of his strong points. In fact, one day back in, back in his prime, he was on an airplane. And when the plane was about to take off, uh, the flight attendant came and, 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 and had repeatedly said to him that he was to put on his seatbelt. And so finally, he told the flight attendant, he says, look, I'm Superman. And Superman don't need no seatbelt. The flight attendant didn't hesitate for a minute when she shot back at him with, oh, Superman also don't need an airplane to fly. So buckle up. It reminds me of a story that I read about a lion, not a true story, but it makes a point. We can call it a parable. The story is told that a lion was proud of his majesty over the animal kingdom. So one day this lion decided to, to make sure that all of the other animals knew he was king of the jungle. He was so confident that he passed by the smaller animals in the jungle and he went straight to the bear. And he said to the bear, who is the king of the jungle? And the bear replied, why, why, why you are, of course. And the lion gave a mighty roar of approval. Yes, I am. Next, the lion went to a tiger. He asked the tiger the same question, who is the king of the jungle? The tiger quickly responded, everybody knows you are mighty lion. Next on the list was the elephant, big, humongous elephant. So the lion went and faced the elephant and he addressed the same question to the elephant that he addressed to the other animals. Who is the king of the jungle? The elephant didn't say a word, but the elephant immediately grabbed the lion with his trunk, whirled him around in the air about five or six times, and then he took the lion and he slammed him into a tree. And if that was not enough, he then pounded the lion into the ground several times. He dunked him in under the water in a nearby lake. And finally, he dumped him out on the shore. The prideful lion, beaten, bruised, and battered, he struggled to his feet. He looked at the elephant through sad and bloody eyes. And he said to the elephant, look, just because you don't know the answer to who is the king of the jungle, there is no reason for you to get mean about it. Naaman 
this morning in our scripture was a great general in the Syrian army. Listen to verse 1, 2 Kings 5. It says, Now Naaman commanded the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. A great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him, the Lord, keep that fact in mind, by him, the Lord, had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of, of valor, but he was a leper. Naaman was truly a great man. He was a powerful military leader, honorable among his peers, and he was used to bring deliverance to Syria from its enemies. He was a great man of courage and valor, but he was still a man who was locked in chains of sin and death. This great general, Naaman, had the world under his control. He had everything right. He had it right where he wanted it. He was at the height of his career. But there was this little disease problem that destroyed his body with nasty, pusterous sores all over his body. Naaman, as great as he was, had leprosy. He was a leopard. And when you had leprosy in those days, nobody wanted to be around you. You were banded from life. In fact, in those days, they had leprosy camps for all of those who were unclean. The Bible, the Bible often used leprosy as a symbol of sin in the heart of man. In those days, there were no cure for this, this, this dreaded disease. And once it was contracted, it was, a, it, was, it was a sentence of death. It was a terrible disease causing a rotting of the body and, and the eating away of the flesh. Sometimes a person's, uh, uh, the half of a person's face could be eaten away by this disease. It was, it was, it was hideous. It would disfigure individuals, and often leopards would die alone because nobody dared to touch them. Terrible disease. But in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter and the second verse, it says to us this morning that the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel. And among those that they had taken out of the land of Israel, they had taken a little maid, maiden, and she waited on Naaman's wife. But the little girl uh, was probably not even a teenager yet, but she found herself as a slave in Syria. She had been taken from her home by force and then forced to wait up upon this great man, she was one of God's chosen people who had been taken into slavery. A child of God, I want to say this morning, and when I say a child of God, I'm talking about all of us here in this service today. A child of God is often found in places where they are uncomfortable, and where they are forced to work in places, and even today in jobs that they don't necessarily like, and under circumstances where uh, at times you might wonder, why did God put me here? But saints of God, as, as Sister Clementine would say, God at times put us in places not only for the benefit of those that we will influence, keep in mind what I just said, for the benefit of those that we will influence, but God at times put us in, in such places for our own good, 
as well as to test our faith and, and our commitment and to, to him and to reveal the weaknesses in us so that we can begin to trust God and correct those things in our hearts that ought not to be there. In 2 Kings, the fifth chapter in the third verse, the Bible says that this, 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 this maid, this little girl, she said to her uh, mistress, would my God, my Lord, would that, that my Lord were, was, was, was able to be with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Apparently, uh, Naaman was also a kind man, because this 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 girl was 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 this girl was was desirous of his healing of his health. If he was a mean man, she probably she probably would not have thought about suggesting that he would go to Samaria where he might find healing. But uh, not only being a a mighty man of valor. But apparently he was a kind man also in the home. And so this little, this little girl had, as, as, as a slave, put, in, put into that situation. And because of her relationship with God, that's what we must always remember in whatever situation we find ourselves, we must always remember our relationship with God. She was not praying for his, his death. She was not... She was, not, she was not praying for his demise, as it were, but she wanted to see this, this man, her master, she wanted to see him heal. And so there's a lesson for us to be learned from her attitude this morning. And that is that even in bad situations, in, 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 in circumstances that we rather not be involved or experience, such as having a boss perhaps at your job that you just can't stand, or another co-worker that you just can't stand, or, or that you, you're in a job where you feel trapped. The lesson learned from this little girl is that even in situations like that, we should allow our lights to still shine so that people can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. In a similar situation, we find in Genesis, the 39th chapter, it says that Joseph had been taken into Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, and that he had been purchased by Potiphar, another captain. He had been purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer, Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And the Bible says, the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. Lord was with Joseph. And Potiphar noticed. And Potiphar realized that the Lord was with Joseph. Giving him success in everything that he did. And that pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owed. In other words, he made Joseph the steward of his house. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything. From the day Joseph was put in, in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord uh, began to bless Potiphar's house. Notice what the Bible says. He began to bless Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and his his uh, his livestock it just flourished. Where you are, God has placed you there for a reason. And even though your co-workers may not recognize it, but because you are allowing your light to so shine, 
God is not only blessing you, but it's giving God an opportunity to bless them. So my friends, God has commissioned us to be shining lights in a dark, decadent world. And we must allow our lights to shine at all times and, and in all situations, just as this young girl did. And so whatever situation we find ourselves in, let us not be too quick to want to, to, want to get away, but let's allow time for God to, to demonstrate to us his purpose for putting us in various situations. We just might be the only one there at the job or wherever we find ourselves because of our personality, our demeanor, our past experience. We might just be the only one who could ever reach that one man or woman that God has placed us there to be reached. So that young slave girl in Naaman's house, even though she was in a foreign country, foreign field, a slave, like the three Hebrew wor worthies and, and Daniel in Babylon, she never forgot about her God, nor did she lose her trust in the, in the power of God being able to deliver on his promises. Maybe she came from a poor background. We don't know. Maybe she came from a family that uh, had to, to, to scratch out a living from the dry earth to make, to make it from day to day. We don't know. But the one thing we do know is that she knew her God. It really didn't matter where she came from. What mattered was the fact that she knew God and she knew where she was going and who was really in control of her life. It's important that regardless of what challenges we run into in life, come what may, we must always remember who is really in control of our lives. That young girl uh, knew where her master could find help. And like a Christian pointing a lost soul to Jesus today, she pointed Naaman to the prophet of God who carried the power to heal him of his leprosy. And so Naaman went to the, went to the king of Syria who uh, honored him and told the king of Syria what this little girl had said to him. And the king of Syria, because of his relationship with Naaman, quickly wrote a letter and, and sent Naaman on his way uh, to Samaria to speak with this man of God. We know the sad story of how the king of uh, the king of Samaria received that letter and felt that he was being set up by the king of Syria. But in actuality, God, God was opening a door, an opportunity for uh, Jeroboam to witness, to witness to Syria of who the ruler, the true God actually was. God opens doors. God provides opportunities for witnessing. But the king felt that he was being set up. But Elisha, when he received word, he was most upset. And he let it be known to the king of Samaria. But eventually, Naaman is able to find his way to the home of Elisha. And so in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, verses 9 and 10, we're told that Naaman came with his horses 
his entourage, I might say, his horses and his and his chariot, and, and he stood at the at, at the house of Elisha. Elisha's home, I'm sure, was no palace. It was not what a man of of, of Naaman's stature uh, would expect to be sent to. You got to remember who Naaman was, man of valor. He was a hero of Syria. Uh, he would not expect to be sent to a house as humble as Elisha. Elisha's home was no palace. Might have been a hut on the side of the road or a hut, you know, uh, positioned back in the woods. Whatever it was, we can be assured it was not what a man of naming stature and status would expect to be sent. And if the house wasn't enough, if it wasn't insulting enough, the man of God that he was sent to didn't even have enough respect to come out and meet him and greet him and, 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 and share words of, of excitement that this man of valor had come to his house, but instead he sends a messenger unto him. And he simply says through the messenger, go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come upon thee again, and thou shalt be clean. For Naaman, it was most humiliating to be treated like that in front of this entourage that he had brought with him from Syria. How could he be treated in such a way? How could he be demeaned in such a way? He expected to be treated differently. He expected more. I recall that it was in January of 2017, just days after officially becoming uh, the president of the United States, that, that uh, President Donald Trump, our former president, he was handed an invitation uh, for a formal state visit to the United Kingdom. Sources reported that when he received that invitation, that uh, President Trump wanted the same treatment as his predecessor had received, Barack Obama. Barack Obama, when invited, he had stayed overnight in the palace with the queen. Obama and his wife during a state visit that he had made in 2011. And according to sources out of the United Kingdom, White House advisors feared a hizzy fit if Trump thought he was getting less than Mr. Obama. But what happened was that when the time of the visit arrived, and that was in 2019, that the palace was undergoing extensive renovations. Even the royal household members had had to move out. But in spite of large swatches of the building being closed off, President Trump reportedly demanded, because of who he was, that he was to stay, he was to stay in the palace. That was his, that was his demand. Naaman was not sent to a palace, but as I said, probably to a little hut on the side of the road. Imagine that, this great man of the world, a self-made man of means, man who had brought a large sum of gifts and money, is sent to a little hut on the side of the road or in the woods, but not to a palace. He must have thought that 
his status itself would have commanded more authority and respect. He must have thought that even the God of Israel would have sat up and taken notice of who he was and that Elijah, God's manservant, would have, would have come out more immediately to his aid. He might have thought that, that, that Elisha uh, would, have, would have come out and, and bowed before him and, 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 and asked for an autograph and, and stood beside him so he could have taken an ancient selfie. But it didn't happen that way. And it impacted on his pride. And as a sidebar, doesn't that sound like some of us? Doesn't that sound like some people we might know at the work, at work, and even in the church? People that believe that they are God's gift to mankind and that God just couldn't do anything without them. They feel that that God uh, that they deserve God's best, and that is what they expect of God and, and everyone else. God knows about my commitment. God knows how much I give. God knows how much I work. God knows how much I pray. God knows how much I study. I do everything you ask of me, Lord. So why can't I why why can't I get the due recognition that I deserve? I want to say to us this morning, my friends, even if we think that way, even if you think that way, you are headed for a fall because God is no respecter of persons. Let us re be reminded today that all of our good works do not earn us any special rewards in heaven or any, spec any special recognition on God's part. After all, all good works are expected of men and women who have been born again. Good works, which in the scriptures are known as fruits of, of righteousness, should be a, a natural byproduct of everything. But the judgment, what we do, what we don't deserve anything but the judgment of God because all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Remember this, it is only by his mercy and his grace that we are even breathing today. So let us thank God for his daily blessings, but let us never place ourselves on a pedestal as something higher or more deserving than anyone else. Bible tells us about two men that went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed and thanked God that he was not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like the, even like the tax collector beside him. He bragged about fasting twice a day and giving a tenth of all that he had, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to the heavens but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home. And he went home just justified. He went home justified that day. Let us not think more of ourselves than we should. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be, will be exalted. Naaman thought more of himself than who he actually, he actually was.
and Naaman turned, and when he was told to go and wash in the muddy, dirty waters of Samaria, Naaman says, are not the rivers in Damascus much clearer and better? And so Naaman turned and went away in a rage because of his pride. 2 Kings 5.13 tells us that his servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. I want to say to us this day, that what God tells us to do often makes no sense to the flesh. It doesn't make sense to cry in an altar. But that's where the heart is broken before God. It doesn't make sense that we must be born again. Even Nicodemus said, but that is what must happen. It doesn't make sense to the world for a man to give up a lucrative job, sell all that he owns, uproot his family, and travel thousands of miles to a foreign land to preach the gospel. And that's exactly what God does when he sends missionaries out to reach the lost. Naaman had too much pride to accept the fact that the prophet would not come out to see him. And it really got bad when all uh, he told him to do was to go and dip seven times in a muddy river. How could that heal leprosy? And that mud might even make it worse. But Laman would have... Laman would have left there because of his pride, unchanged that day, if it had not been for the urging of his servant. I want to submit to you today, my friends, that his pride was at work. And pride is the greatest sin that lingers in the hearts of men. Pride causes us to think more highly of ourselves than we should. The London Times reported that President Trump also requested on another occasion, another visit uh, to England. He wanted to ride with Queen Elizabeth in a golden plated chariot during his visit to the United Kingdom. See, pride keeps us from humbling ourselves before others and, and, and God in complete submission. And so it's no wonder that the Bible says pride comes before a fall. The fall comes because pride won't let us repent of our sins and turn to God in humility. And so in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, in the 14th verse, he finally humbled himself and he went down to the water. He humbled himself and he got out, off, out of his chariot. He took off his, his royal robes. He took off his medals and, and, and prizes of flesh and repented and repented of his anger at the prophet, and he obeyed God. He started dipping, and I can just imagine what he might have thought with every dip. Each time there was more mud in his eyes and his hair, each time he became more doubtful that it was going to, it was going to, going to happen, that he would be healed of his, of his leprosy. Each, with each dip, the water got even muddier. And I want us to know this morning, my friends, it, it's, it's never a pretty or comfortable thing to, to acknowledge and face our sins. It's never comfortable. It's never easy to allow the hidden recesses of our hearts to be revealed for the filth that is hiding there within. James says that the heart is very deceitful, and who can know it? The heart lies to you. You can't trust it ever. How many times do you have to go back to be uh, cleansed by the blood of Jesus because you followed your heart? With each passing day, uh, the mud of the world gets into our hearts, our minds, and our spirits, and, and we have to go back and, and dip again into the blood of Jesus. It's a never-ending process. 
but this is what we this is what we have to do. Apostle Paul says, I know to do right, but I find that evil is always with me. So Naaman reluctantly set aside his pride and he did what made no medical ancient sense. He went down to the river. He went down, he dipped once, nothing happened. He dipped twice, then five, and then six times and still nothing happened. And Naaman was probably ready to say, forget this. I've been humiliated. This is foolishness. I'm going back to Syria. But I want to say to you this day, my friends, when God says seven times, six won't do. You have to go all the way. You have to cross the finish line in order to win. Quitters don't win and winners never quit. It's either all the way or nothing with God. And so on that seventh time, he went down. And when he went down that seventh time, as God had commanded, when he came up, the leprosy was healed. He was delivered and he was given a new lease on life. Yes, he was a great man by world standards, but he was a leopard. And so this day, I want to say to us as I'm coming to a close, don't let the accolades of the world fool you. Don't let others tell you that you can get to heaven with sin in your heart. Don't let your own heart lie to you and tell you that it's all right when sin still remains in your heart. Give it all to Jesus hold back nothing. The only way to get rid of the leprosy of sin is to give to God all that he requires. Every one of us today can identify with, with Naaman and in one way or another. Oftentimes, pride won't let us repent. Oftentimes, pride won't let us confess our shortcomings. Pride won't let us admit that we're in the wrong. Pride makes us try to force other people to see things our way. Pride won't set back and, and, and let God move in his own time. But pride steps in and often causes division and, and grief. As Elder, as Elder Gibson shared with us this morning in the Sabbath school lesson. But I wanna thank God for the Holy Ghost who keeps urging us on. Naaman's uh, delivery came only when he plunged into the Jordan seven times. Seven times. And the greatest part of this text is when Naaman returned and, and he wanted to pay for his great deliverance, but the answer came, no charge, no charge. And my friends, that's the best part. A lifetime of giving could never pay for the sin debt that we owe because Jesus paid it all. And in paying it all upon the cross of Calvary, it symbolized to us no charge because the gift of eternal life is free. Praise God for that today. And so God's appeal to us today, God's appeal to us today, my friends, is to let go and let God have his way in our lives. If you still have this deadly thing called pride in your life, you too can be cleansed. Why not experience the cleansing power of God right now? Ajax can't do it. Comet can't do it. Clorox can't whiten you whiter. Dove can't soften your old heart, hardened skin and heart but you can be freed from the bonds of sin this morning 
by allowing Jesus to come in to your heart. He can cleanse your heart with his blood, the soul cleansing blood of the spotless lamb of God that was sacrificed on the cross for our sins. That is the only way that we can be cleansed. No other way will do it. Only God's way will work. So why not today allow God to make you whole again? Why not go and dip in God's love? I want you to know that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. That's our appeal song for this Sabbath. Near the end of World War II, a soldier wrote home about the strange sights he saw while he was in France. It happened while France was being liberated. He saw Germans jumping and shouting for joy at the thought of being taken prisoners and escaping the fighting. He saw many wounded Germans gratefully accepting allied offers of mercy. But one German, a stern German officer, refused help. This SS man required an immediate blood transfusion. And he asked the question, Will it be British blood, he asked. The doctor nodded. Healthy British blood. And you will die if you do not take it. German officer frowned at his benefactor and his face tightened into a, a rigid frown. And then he said, I would rather die. His pride would not allow him to have the transfusion. And so a few hours later, his body was prepared for burial. That man was crazy, you might say. He should have taken the transfusion of blood and lived, but he chose rather because of pride to die. And so my dear ones, are we in the same situation this morning? If you don't take the transfusion of blood that Christ has provided for you, Christ has provided for us, we too, you too, will die an even more horrible death than that man that soldier. The death that the Bible talks about will be an eternal punishment. But God help us this morning to set our pride aside. Let us take our pride and, 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 and put it away and let's allow God to have his way in our hearts. Let us not allow Satan to harden our hearts this morning. Let's not allow family and friends to stand in the way, but let us allow God to have his way. He can do it. He can save us. Many years ago, there was a little girl by the name of Liz who was suffering from a rare, serious disease. And her only chance of recovery appeared to be a blood transfusion from her five-year-old brother who had miraculously survived the same disease and had developed the antibodies that 
were needed to come back the illness that she was now suffering. And so the doctors explained the situation to her little brother and asked the little boy if he would be willing to give his blood to his sister. He hesitated for only a moment before taking a deep breath and saying to the doctor, yes, I'll do it if it will save her life. As the transfusion progressed, he laid in bed next to his sister and smiled as the medical staff also did. And seeing color return in the cheeks of his sister, there was celebration. And as they were celebrating in that room, the little boy's face grew pale and his smile faded. And he looked up at the doctor and he asked the doctor with a trembling voice, will I start to die right away? Being young and innocent as he was, the little boy had not understood the doctor when he said that his blood would save his sister's life. He had thought that by giving his blood to save his sister, all of his blood would be taken. He was willing to give his life to save the life of his sister. I want to say to us today that Christ was willing to set aside his position in the heavenly courts. He who was equal with God thought it not robbery to set aside that position and to humble himself and take on the form of a man and a servant and to be obedient unto death to save man's life. If God thought enough of us to do that, I want to urge all of us today to think enough of God to give ourselves to him unreservedly. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunged beneath that flood can lose all their guilt in shame. Let me urge you today, my friends, as, as the one who loved Naaman urged him to go to the man of God. Let us go to the word of God. Let us read, and then let us go down to the river. Let us go down to the river of God's love. Let us, let us plunge ourselves and come up and be made whole is my prayer in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen.
plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stay Shall be changed.